Terra incognita spectator. Terra incognita spectator. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson, and every month TISF brings you the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. Please visit tisf.com.au for links to author and publisher websites and author information. This month's story comes from Rob Hood, often referred to with a little tongue-in-cheek, but also a deal of sincerity as the godfather of Australian horror. Over the decades, Rob has produced a significant body of short stories, articles, novels and collections, as well as co-editing the popular Daikaju giant monster anthologies from Agog Press. His story, The Slime Light and How to Step Into It, is an example of his more light-hearted side, with a whole new twist on alien possession. When Harry Freemaker came across a monstrosity in the lane off Queen's Park Road, he knew that at last his luck had changed for the better. He didn't realise his good fortune straight away, of course. At first he was dead scared, fainting rather theatrically into the refuse from an overturned bin. He'd been picking a tentative course along Rally Lane after a night of boozing in the Queen's Bar, his belly and head shifting lazily under the liquid weight of a dozen or so beers. The laneway was dark... But Harry had never been scared of ghosts and murderers, except maybe when he was eight or so and the shadows behind garbage bins and posts had been bigger than he was. Now, in his prime, there were few murderers who were bigger than Harry's 25 stone and the insubstantiality of ghosts held few terrors for someone as fleshy as Harry. But if thoughts of spectres and killers didn't make him nervous, the idea of amorphous creatures from outer space did. Once, when Harry was younger, a school buddy had dropped a container full of custard over his head right smack in the middle of the blob movie. Ever since then, Harry had nurtured an aversion for living heaps of slime somewhere in the broom cupboard of his psyche, though he considered there wasn't much need to worry about the problem, amorphous creatures from outer space being largely confined to 1950s sci-fi films. So when Harry saw a movement under the smeared glimmer thrown behind an overturned bin by distant streetlights and went and looked, the sight of the massive greenish slime ball froze his heart and made his sinuses pop. Blood rushed in his ears. A single eye at least as big as Harry's hand appeared out of the ooze and blinked at him. A mouth dripping with muck opened beneath it and made a few sounds that would have revealed themselves as the initial syllables of ordinary English words if Harry had managed to stay conscious long enough to hear them. What the creature said was, But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? And it said it with feeling. Unfortunately, the creature's only available audience was catatonic before the third syllable was uttered. When Harry awoke, the nightmare hadn't gone away. Somewhere deep in his delirium, he'd been hoping the greenish lump of living slime was an alcoholic will-o'-the-wisp. No such luck. The thing was grinning at him as he opened his eyes. When his mouth contorted into a scream, it said, You're not going to faint again, are you? The voice sounded so normal, so familiar, that it arrested Harry's terror on the spot and filled him with something resembling indigestion. The slime heap's words were formed immaculately, the inhuman lips moving like huge slabs of greasy bacon, but releasing the sound as smoothly as cream from a jug. Another eye, a smaller one, had decided to join the first through the surrounding tide of ooze, wobbling uncertainly like a piece of fruit in a custard jelly, and though neither looked very stable, both seemed benign enough. "'Who are you?' said Harry, still lying flat on his back. "'I don't have a name,' the creature burped, and a fetid tang whisked towards Harry's nostrils. "'Where are you from, then?' "'Somewhere dark, a place that doesn't have a name.' Harry tried not to notice the dripping and quivering of the creature's jellied flesh, if it was flesh. Well, what do you want? The slime thing sidled closer, the squirming globules that were its features rising and sinking through the ooze with no apparent rhythm. I want to be a famous Shakespearean actor, it said, and I need your help to do it. Harry was not easily sold on the idea. Sure, it was clear enough the slime ball wasn't going to make it as an actor on its own. Harry tried to imagine it playing Romeo or 
Hamlet or even Richard I, but his imagination didn't extend that far. Even ignoring this problem, how on earth could Harry help to achieve its ambition? Despite the fact Harry was a member of the South Kura Kura Amateur Dramatic Society, he never got any roles and was never given any responsibilities because he was too fat and ugly and interested in eating and was a lousy actor to boot. And if Harry couldn't make it because of his appearance, what chance did the slime thing have? Compared to the ugly creature, Harry looked like Robert Redford. Besides, explained Harry, sitting with his back wedged against a warehouse wall, I only joined SCAD so I could perv on Wendy Smidmore in the change rooms. Oh no, you didn't. The thing extended a tentacle of translucent slime and tapped Harry on the nose. You can't fool me, you know. You want to be an actor. You want fame. You want fortune. You hate being held in contempt by all the little people that surround you, though naturally you've given up admitting it to yourself long ago, because it's easier to give in to appetite and obesity than it is to struggle for acceptance, knowing it might be turned against you at any time, knowing that perhaps in the long run the contempt is justified anyway. So you fulfil your own self-loathing, your self-contempt, you wallow and give yourself sordid excuses for pottering around the edges of a life you'd love to make your own. Harry nodded. It was true, brilliantly true, and he didn't mind admitting to the truth when he was dealing with something that was probably a figment of his imagination anyway. He did want to be a famous actor, someone people not only respected but who entertained them, uplifted them, changed their lives, someone who gave them meaning by expressing the true nobility of the human soul, someone in immortality's limelight. But why in the ordinary course of events would you admit to feelings like those? It was too ridiculous to contemplate. People would laugh. So, he said, what if I do? So, said the creature, you help me and I'll help you. I'm a great actor, the best. A genius to rank with Laurence Olivier, Ralph Richardson, Richard Burton. But you're a bloody slime ball, if you'll pardon me for saying so. How can you play Hamlet? That's exactly the point. I can, with your help. Harry knocked aside the slime ball's jellyish tentacle, was repulsed by the slimy feel of it, and drew himself back against the wall. How the hell can I help? I'm not a theatrical agent. No, but you've got a body, and I need one. It globbed into motion, squishing backwards and forwards in front of Harry. For God's sake, use your imagination, Harry. You've seen all those B-grade monster pictures. What does the invader from outer space do? It possesses a human being, of course. What else? You're going to possess me? It pushed Harry's chest, forcing him back into a sitting position. Relax. I can only take over your body if you let me. And you'll still own it anyway. We'll just be sharing it. And how does all this help me? Ah, therein lies the rub. Once I'm in you, you'll have my acting ability. I'll make you into a star before the year's out. You'll rock it to the top. Everyone will love you. You'll be... Adored. Adored? Harry considered the possibility. He'd never been adored, not that he was aware of anyway. His mother had tolerated him, even hugged him occasionally, but such spontaneous acts of affection had usually come only after the gin bottle had been emptied and the soapies were over. She'd never been particularly willing to touch him when he was a kid. Then his father had left home to live with a girl he'd met in the laundrette, and for a while... Harry had been a poor substitute. But once Harry developed pimples, she'd started locking herself in a bedroom with the TV on whenever he came home. How do you take me over then, Harry said. The slime thing smiled. At least it looked like a smile, a wet, viscous slash in its heaving bulk. Ah, oh, that's the easy part, Harry, my dear. You just eat me. Eat you? Sure. I taste a bit raspberry ish, I'm told. How he managed the task, Harry couldn't say. Yet, oddly enough, once he got started, it was quite easy. The first few bites were the worst, the exquisite anticipation, revulsion lurking in each swallow, his awareness of the creature's eyes watching him as he lifted the mound of scooped-up muck to his mouth, then the texture of slime at his tongue. But as the living muck squished between his teeth, he discovered the taste was quite pleasant, very pleasant, in fact, 
and if he asked the creature to sink its eyes out of sight, he forgot he was eating something sentient and could pretend he was picking out on a huge serving of raspberry jelly. Toward the end, he drifted into a Dionysian stupor and must have fallen asleep as the last morsel slid down his gullet. He remembered thinking that the creature was quite uniform in taste and consistency. He found no sign of eyes or mouth or bones, nor nasty, grisly bits. Only jelly, lots of jelly. And that was just as well, he reckoned, because otherwise he might have involuntarily sicked up the masticated creature all over the alleyway. Harry woke as the light of dawn granulated the air, pushing shadows into dim corners and turning the smog yellow. As his eyes opened, he remembered everything and looked around for evidence of the feast. There was nothing. He felt slightly bloated. That was all. Probably the result of too much beer. Struth, he muttered, pushing his bulk into a sitting position. What a revolting nightmare. He swayed onto his feet, brushing garbage from his clothes. I must have tripped on this stuff, he thought. Tripped and then fallen asleep. What a nightmare. He considered the adoration the dream blob had offered him and drew himself up as though to deliver a speech. Instead of dramatic epigrams, a, a cough hacked from his lungs, setting his belly wobbling. It nearly locked him down. Ridiculous, he groaned, and heaved himself into motion. When he got to his flat, he went straight to bed. He felt too wretched to eat, and the thought of doing anything physical drained the remaining strength from him instantly and completely. His sleep was dreamless. When next he opened his eyes, he felt a lot better. The extra weight had gone from his belly, his head was clear, depression had withdrawn like a retreating tide, leaving only a few minor stains in the sand to mark its passing. He had a shower, got dressed, and decided in favour of breakfast. But there was nothing he wanted to eat in the fridge. The bacon looked disgustingly fatty. The piece of leftover pavlova reminded him of something he'd seen in the rubbish he'd slept on top of yesterday, and the eggs were off. He slammed the fridge door. That was when he caught sight of the notice pinned there by a magnet shaped like a hamburger. South Kura Kura Amateur Dramatic Society Auditions March 14 and 15 at 7.30pm SCADS announces auditions for actors and actresses to take part in a production of Shakespeare's Macbeth, scheduled for June and July. All parts open. Ring Barbara on 254-6970 for details of audition pieces. Or come to the Town Hall Theatre on either day and you might end up a star. Give yourself a go. Give yourself a go, Harry thought. Today was March 15. He pondered the coincidence of his having had that particular nightmare last night and wondered whether it was an omen. Should he try out for this production? It would be the first time he'd ever auditioned. Naturally, he wouldn't get Macbeth or what's-his-name, Macbeth's nemesis, but maybe the other one, the one who ends up a ghost, or one of the bit parts, something fairly minor. He might have a chance. Go for the lead. Harry looked up, startled. The voice had come from... Well, he couldn't tell for sure. The kitchen tidy, perhaps. It's me, Harry, the slime ball. I'm inside you. Harry looked askance at his stomach. Oh, no. I'd just convinced myself it was all a nightmare and I wasn't going mad after all. Nevertheless, it's me. And we're going for the lead. Macbeth, the murderer king. It's a great part. I couldn't do it. You won't have to. I'll be doing all the work. There'll be no problem. You know Macbeth off backwards. I do not. I've never even read it. You know it backwards, believe me. I do not. And I don't intend to audition at all. I wouldn't have a chance. You might, or might not, be inside me. But either way, I'm still fat, awkward, Harry, and no one in their right mind is going to give me a part like that, or any other part either. I make more of a difference than you think, Harry. Try it now. Do the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech. I don't know it. You do. I don't, for God's sake. Try it, Harry. If you can't do it, I'll stop bugging you. If you can do it, you audition. What do you say? Harry, his blood boiling at the sheer nerve of this incorporeal voice, nodded, adopted a mock stance and made gulping noises. See? Nothing. 
Just start, Harry. It goes. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps. Harry felt an instantaneous rush of verbiage leap up his throat, as though propelled from somewhere deep in his gut. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. The words flowed easily, not simply remembered, but uttered with passion and despair, Macbeth's despair. Out! Out, brief candle! Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Harry was nonplussed. I do know it. You know the whole play, said the voice, and chuckled. Somebody snickered when Harry came up to the table where Barbara Sharkey was taking down the names of those wishing to audition. You want to audition, she said. What for? For a part in Macbeth. What else? replied Harry, glancing nervously around the foyer. Steve Rackmire was there, lounging against the tea-serving bar. Handsome, slim and cool. A certainty for the lead, if ever there was one. He always got the male lead in Scad's productions. People liked him. Wendy Smidmore was there too, hovering around Steve. She would be Lady Macbeth, no doubt, although Barbara herself would possibly want that role. Barb's was larger than Wendy, who was shapely and youthful. Barb's wasn't a very good actress, but she held the reins of political power within the theatre group and generally got what she wanted. They're open auditions, aren't they? Harry whispered. Sure, Harry, sure. But what role were you thinking of auditioning for? Barbara looked at him from under her thick eyebrows disapprovingly, as though she thought this inclination to challenge his part in the status quo quite vandalistic. One of the soldiers? Um, I was thinking of Macbeth himself. Macbeth? I can try for it, can't I? he said. She looked at him, as if deciding whether or not he were joking. In fact, everyone within earshot was looking at him. He felt a suffocating urge to run away. Stick with it, said the slime thing's voice. Don't be put off by these jerks. OK, OK. Pardon? said Barbara. What do you want me to do? Barbara gestured uncertainly toward a table covered in photocopied extracts. We're using audition pieces. You can just read them. No need for that, he muttered, and stalked through the door into the theatre. They sent Harry up onto the stage third, and which was last. Only three people were trying out for Macbeth. Steve Rackmire was first. Watching him, Harry felt the irresistible futility of his slime-appointed task. Rackmire wasn't brilliant or anything, he wasn't even particularly good, but he had style and grace and a track record that went back through successful productions for several years. Barbara rather fancied him. All during his performance, she watched him with a slackness at the edge of her mouth that made her seem to be dribbling. He'll get a vote for sure, Harry said. As it turned out, Barbs was going to direct the show, so her vote meant a lot. She's not the only one on the selection panel, commented the slime voice. And besides, she hasn't seen you yet. She might want to get into Rackmire's pants, but she'll want you as Macbeth even more. Colin Petrie, the local poultry supplier, went next. He was quite good, but reminded everyone of a chook worrying about the sky falling on its head. Then suddenly, it was Harry's turn. You're on, Freemaker, Barbs growled at him. If you still want to go through with this... Break a leg, Harry, said the voice inside him. I'll be with you all the way, old man. All the way. Harry closed his eyes and stood. He swallowed. Someone snickered. A few people choked back their comments. Harry involuntarily glanced up at Wendy Smidmore on the stage. She was reading in the Lady Macbeth parts and noticed a look of sheer disgust on her face. Then he'd made it up the narrow stairs at the side and was standing gazing down at the dimmed auditorium, trying to give features to the dark blotches that were the selection panel and the other auditionees. The space was vast and fearsome. What uh, bit do you want, he managed to say, though his mouth was dry and constricted. Have you got the audition sheet up there, Harry? No, I don't need it. Just tell me what scene you want. The whole theatre had gone quiet, waiting for him to entertain them, not in the way he would have liked, but unintentionally, by making a fool of himself. 
Uh, right then, the scene where Macbeth's come from murdering the king. Start from where you speak, Wendy. Try not to explode, fat boy, a cry came from the darkened auditorium. And we'll try not to laugh. Harry was about to run off stage when the sound of Wendy's voice saying, I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? Grabbed his thoughts in a fist of steel, pushing emotion into his heart, his eyes, his voice. He spun toward Wendy and suddenly he was a Scottish warrior. You were absolutely amazing, Harry. I've never seen you like that before. I forgot who I was when you were speaking, forgot who you were. It was fantastic. Wendy Smidmore's enthusiasm stayed with him all week. He hugged it to his heart like a love letter and relived it continually. He remembered her face, a light with some emotion he couldn't put a name to. Perhaps it was adoration. He wasn't in a position to tell. But the light in her eyes made him hot. For the first time in his life, he felt he could ask her out and not be mocked. He would have done so on the spot, but it was too soon. He needed to get used to the idea first. He was offered the part of Macbeth, of course. They almost begged him to take it. Everyone was extremely enthusiastic. Even Steve Rackmeyer came up to him afterwards and shook his hand. Congratulations, Harry, he said. You're a rotten bastard. If I'd known what sort of a show you were going to put on, I would have tried harder. It was the beginning of a new life for Harry. Rehearsal started the next week and it quickly became apparent that Harry needed little direction. In fact, his interpretation of the character moulded the style of the whole production. Eventually, despite her essential arrogance, Barbara Sharkey was seeking Harry's advice, and Harry gave it freely, even humbly, the slime ball whispering its instructions in his ear. Every rehearsal was a gratifying exercise in being adored. The other actors watched him carefully, stunned by his power even during single-line deliveries, when they interacted with him on stage, they showed diffidence and respect. They sought his opinion and afterwards asked him around to their houses or to the hotel or to the late-night pizza joint so they could talk to him, get enthusiastic with him, simply be with him. He was invited to Scad's parties, asked to come to private dinners, made the centre of the in-crowd. Harry stopped eating and drinking so much, though he didn't lose any weight, and went out in the sunlight more often and was introduced to several prominent politicians. He was recognised. The usual rehearsal schedule of three months proved to be far too long. The Scottish tragedy was ready to go public in a month. In fact, cast and crew were itching to start. Under strong pressure from everyone, including Barbara Sharkey, SCAD's management committee pushed publicity coverage forward and announced a May 1st opening night. The group was restless with suppressed excitement. Dress rehearsals ran smoothly. At their first public performance, Harry was even better than usual. No one had thought it possible. His thespian skills extracted good performances, even from those members of the cast who couldn't perform to save their lives. To Harry, Wendy Smidmore was dazzling, her prettiness and innocence acting in delicious counterpoint to the ruthless pragmatism of her character's ambition. During the murder scene, Harry nearly lost his composure, getting distracted by a smile Wendy threw his way. "'Cut it out, Harry!' The jelly voice shrieked. Once Wendy pressed up against him, speaking her lines in a husky whisper, his hand moved down the contours of her body, and for a moment she wasn't Lady Macbeth, and he wasn't the usurping warrior. An electric current shot through the minimal distance between them. After the show, Harry, she hissed in his ear. Then they raged back into their Elizabethan personae. The large crowd gave Harry a standing ovation. He stood before them with tears in his eyes. We did it, slime, he choked, leaving those nearest him to puzzle at his emotion. But the slime voice was silent. At the opening night party, Harry was idolised, his entrance generating spontaneous applause. Everyone wanted to be recognised by him, spoken to, and he spent an hour just reliving the magnificence of his performance. Wendy came in wearing a slinky green dress, off the shoulder and open most of the way down her back. Her auburn hair was frizzed out and her eyes caught at every spark of light in the room, capturing it and throwing it out again enhanced. Harry really did fall in love with her then. He wanted to go to her, but the crowd held him back. Barbara Sharkey came up to him and kissed him demonstratively on the cheek. Congratulations, Harry, she said. I've got some good news for you. Bad news for us, I think. What do you mean? Quentin Phipps was in the audience tonight. 
theatre critic for the Kura Kura Globe. He loved your performance, Harry. Wanted me to tell you that. He had to get back to the office so his review would be in tomorrow's issue, but he knows a lot of prominent people in the theatre world, Harry. Reckons he could get you an interview with one of the professional companies, if that's what you want. How's that grab you? Instant fame, eh? The news brought on another round of adulation from the crowd. Later in the evening, his fans momentarily satisfied and drifting now into a late-night alcoholic stupor, Harry found Wendy sitting alone on a garden chair in the backyard, the breeze shifting her hair like reddish mist around her shoulders. Music pounded dully behind him. He watched her for a while without speaking, entranced by her melancholy and the sensuous curve of her neck. Then he moved toward her, reaching out to touch her gently. "'I'm sick of this, Harry!' said the slime suddenly, smashing Harry's silence, though not the girl's. Sick of the bloody fawning, the sycophancy, all the boring, contemptible mooning for that bloody tart you insist on indulging in. I want to go home. Shut up, will you, yelled Harry, before he could stop himself. Wendy glanced around, startled. Harry? Harry flushed. Oh, I didn't mean you, Wendy. Honest, it was uh, someone else. She nodded doubtfully. She's stupid, Harry, and a crummy actress. Forget her. Let's go home. No! Pardon? said Wendy, slightly alarmed now. Nothing, replied Harry. Wendy, I want to talk to you, to thank you for your efforts. I couldn't have done it without you. What? You must be joking. You could have done it better without her. It's me you should thank. She grinned wistfully. That's nice, Harry, but it's not true. We're provincial and limited. You made it the great show it was. She reached out and touched him. Even through his sweater sleeve, Harry could feel the flow of excitement rushing from her fingers. Give me a break, Harry. Look at her. She's ugly. She's clumsy. There's not an ounce of fat on her. And what's life without a bit of blubber? She's wonderful. Wendy drew back her hand. Who is Harry? You are. Harry had broken into a sweat. He could feel the runnel of moisture trickling down the sensitive flesh on his side. His stomach quivered. I've grown very close to you, Wendy. Very close. I, I I care for you very much. Oh, puke, I can't stand this. What's the matter with you, Harry? I offer you theatrical greatness and you fart around seducing this nobody, this small town slut. I warn you. Warn me? Warn you. Uh, uh, warn you I'm out to get you, Wendy. I, I love you. The words came quickly, given audacity by Harry's sense that it could all go wrong any minute. The bloody slime thing was confusing him. Oh, Harry, I thought you'd never notice me. Wendy pressed herself against him. He felt her breasts against his chest, her thighs drawing him in. Now I warn you, Harry, the slime voice said, cold and menacing. I haven't enjoyed any of this. I want to be a great actor, and I thought you could empathise with me enough to overcome the seductions of this backwater sewer tank. I thought you wanted to be a great actor more than anything else. I thought the desire for it burned in your soul. Harry's mouth trembled over Wendy's. His tongue searched for hers. Bloody scads! What philistines! That production has got to be the greatest travesty I've ever seen. Awful! I hated every minute of it. And you, you're holding me back, Harry. All you want to do is fornicate with this thing that couldn't even play Lady Macbeth if her life depended on it. I thought you had vision. Well, I was obviously wrong. Harry was lost in the warmth of Wendy's closeness. He barely heard the bleatings of his suddenly unwilling lodger. OK, then, that's it, Harry. It'll take me forever to get you out of this place. And there's no fame to be had in bloody South Kura Kura. I'm off. Harry suddenly felt sick. A heaving groan rose from the depths of his stomach, churning his innards like a bad case of colic. Muttering in his guts, making his intestines whimper, Pain jerked him away from Wendy. What's wrong, Harry? He'd gone white, as though someone had doused him in baker's dough. His belly bloated like a huge roasting bread loaf. The slime thing, he thought desperately. What did it say just then? Sit down, Harry. You look awful. Probably excitement. I'm off. I'm off. That's what the voice had said. I'm off. Oh, my God, Harry muttered, feeling sudden panic bloat him further. It wasn't so much the slime ball's departure that worried him, but how it might do it. Harry had seen Alien, had been nauseated along with everyone else as the fetal creature burst from the unfortunate spaceman's abdomen. He recalled the blood, the thrashing about, the agony. 
Not that, he yelled. No, please, not that. Sorry, Harry, the slime boy said. But when you gotta go, you gotta go. I might have known amorphous slime creatures from outer space couldn't be trusted, Harry shrieked and threw up on the back lawn. Next morning it was raining. Harry woke, hearing the sound of water cascading down his bedroom window. The thud of it made his head ache. All that had happened last night flooded back. Wendy's friendliness, the slime creature's sudden temper tantrum, its decision to leave him, the awful heaving sickness in his gut, the first glob of green muck that spewed from his mouth. Harry remembered seeing it strike the ground. It quivered as though adjusting to its renewed freedom. He remembered the tiny eye that surfaced from the muck to wink at him. He remembered Wendy screaming something. Then Harry had run. He'd run as more slime jelly was ejected from his throat. The miniature creatures had oozed along after him, joining up, getting bigger. He'd finally taken shelter in a reserve that backed onto the house where the scad celebration party was still in progress. In the distance, Wendy was yelling. Harry, wrenched by involuntary convulsions, sicked up a huge mass of green goo, so much that the twitching seemed to go on forever. The contortions were making his whole body ache. Then it was over. The slime thing, whole again, loomed over the wasted Harry, who was weeping and drawn in upon himself on the ground, like a child who'd been punched repeatedly in the stomach by a school bully. "'Sorry, Harry, but you're a bit of a disappointment to me, you know,' the slime said. Harry just nodded. "'Actually, the whole business of acting was a bit of a disappointment. I'm beginning to wonder if it's worthwhile. Not much fun being stuck in someone's innards during a long rehearsal period, not to mention the inevitable extended run.' "'What'll I do about the remaining performances of Macbeth?' Harry gasped out, the difficulties he must now face clarifying out of the misty frenzy of his shock. "'Ah, you'll be okay,' the slime said. "'Not brilliant, but okay.' With that it fell silent. Harry had been looking at the ground. He glanced up, and the thing was gone. "'Harry, open the door!' It was Wendy. Harry forced himself to his feet feeling as though the weight of the entire house was resting on his shoulders. He had no idea how long he'd been slouched there. The stiffness in his joints suggested it had been quite some time. Come on, Harry. Are you all right? He slumped against the door, listening to himself breathing in the wood. I'm not going to go away, Harry. If you don't answer me, I'll get the landlord to open up. I'm worried about you. Worried about you? Being worried about was another new sensation for Harry. He didn't quite know what to make of it. What he did know was that something disgusting had happened on the night of Macbeth's opening, right in front of Wendy, and that as a result he no longer had the slime thing inside him. He was just Harry now, fat, ugly Harry. "'Go away, Wendy,' he said. "'I'm OK. I, I just want to be left alone. "'Open the door, Harry.' The voice was so insistent, his desire to see her so intense that he reached out before he could stop himself and release the catch. He stepped back as the door opened. Wendy peered in, frowning slightly. Harry, she said, what's happened to you? For a moment he was afraid to look. Then he glanced down at himself. His belly was smaller. I, um, I, I don't know. I seem to have lost weight. Yeah, I think you have. She gripped his arm. Are you really okay? You looked awful when you ran off last night, uh, positively green. I, I threw up. I know, too much grog, eh? Well, you've had time to get over it. I just thought I'd call by to check on you. You want to come with me to the theatre? Harry felt his heart thud hollowly once and deflate like a leaky balloon. Theatre? Sure, we've got a performance in an hour. Have you forgotten? Ashamed, he turned away, moving for protection toward the kitchen. I can't, Wendy. I can't get up on that stage again. What? Why not, Harry? What could he say? The heap of muck that was doing the acting has packed up its genuine talent and gone home. No, she'd think him mad as well as an idiot. I'll, I'll just make a fool of myself. I can't act that well ever again. Wendy's hand rested on his shoulder. I understand, Harry. But it'll be okay. You'll be terrific. No one expects you to get better each show. No, you don't understand. His head slumped. He wanted to explain, but the only words he had were someone else's. Had I but 
died an hour before this chance I had lived a blessed time. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life is drawn. He stopped, realising what he was saying. Good God, he muttered. I still know it. Of course you do. Did you think getting pissed would blot it all out? No, but, but, uh, but I never really knew it. Well, it sure sounded like it did to me. She hugged him. Come on, we'll be late. Maybe I can do it, he thought. He turned to Wendy, smiling wanly. What could happen? At worst, he'd fail. It didn't matter any more. OK, I'll give it a go, he said. A review from the Kura Kura Globe. Theatrical highlights. Quentin Phipps. The Scads production of Macbeth, which is causing a sensation throughout town, has, for this critic at least, improved with every performance. Harry Freemaker's opening night portrayal of the murderer king was certainly a tour de force. But it seems to me that since then, Freemaker has really settled into the role and is now bringing to it a mature and stunning elegance. His second night, Macbeth, was not simply a villain caught on the cleft stick of his own ambition, but a man desperately struggling with the spectre of powerlessness. Freemaker's Macbeth has, for this critic, become more human. This month's review book is Tender Morsels by Margot Lanigan. Broadly speaking, there are two types of fantasy. The first is content to play around with those standard fantasy characters and situations and deliver more of the same. The second breaks out of those confines and serves to, as Tolkien himself put it, clean our windows so that the things seen clearly may be freed from the jab blur of triteness or familiarity. Tender Morsels, a new novel from Margot Lanigan, coming on a string of award-winning collections, is firmly in the second category. Liga lives with her father in an abusive relationship on the outskirts of a medievalish town somewhere in the European countryside. The victim of incest, her father frequently consults a local witch for a means to bring on a miscarriage for her. Liga suffers greatly, not really understanding what's happening to her body, but when her father is killed on his way home one night, she's left alone in their hovel to give birth. Shortly after, she's group-raped by the local boys, and deeply distressed, she takes her baby to a precipice, intent that they should both die. Instead, an outside agency takes pity on her and creates Liga's own private heaven, where she and her baby, babies, when the product of the rape is eventually born, live a kind of halcyon life. While all this may sound dreadfully depressing, Margot maintains tight control of the action, providing lead-up and aftermath, but avoiding what would otherwise be graphically horrible events. It's also fair to say that Tender Morsels has a fairy tale sensibility, and the depredations suffered by Liga are in their own way modern equivalents of the child abandonments, enchantments and murders of more traditional fairy tales. And despite its gruesome beginning, there's a great deal of lightness and joy in the novel as Liga and her two growing children learn about the world they're in and ultimately begin to interact with the real world beyond the boundaries of their existence. As well as the obvious originality of this story, another draw card is the language used. Margot is a gifted writer with a beautiful control of language that is at once evocative and poetic. There are also some deep lessons to be learned as we follow the character's development through the narrative. Truths about hopes and desires, the price we pay in running away from our pain, and the bittersweet rewards of dealing with reality. Four stars. Tender Morsels is published in Australia by Alan and Unwin. You've been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to featured authors' websites and to their publications and for other information. The rights holder grants a licence to you to download these audio files for your private, personal, domestic, non-commercial use only. You may not use these audio files for any other purpose. Copyright of the stories remains with the author. The book review in this podcast is copyright Keith Stevenson, 2008.
Tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. Oh, <laughs> my